just to our website. So I know there will be a lot of questions. We are going to have two Q&A sessions during this meeting uh, to, to go through questions you've asked. And um, the other thing that's important about the chat is if you ask, so take advantage of that. Uh, quick introductions. There are probably three main people you're going to be hearing from tonight. My name is Chris Vogelsang, and I'm the consultant project manager. Um, and then I'll let uh, Geneva Hooten introduce herself. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Geneva Hooten, and I am the project manager for a number of these tonight. And I will hand it off to David to also introduce himself. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is David Pulsifer, and I'm a planning supervisor with uh, DOTI, that's the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. And uh, my team oversees the bicycle and pedestrian planning. And we're, again, really glad that you're here with us tonight. Great. Okay, I do also want to recognize, um, so our, our council members have made uh, the effort to join us and, and participate. So I just want to recognize that um, Councilman Flynn, Councilman Clark, and staff from Councilman Tory's office all here at the meeting and listening to our presentation and, and community input. Um, so thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us. Uh, Chris, I think Councilwoman Torres is here also. I see her name on the list. Councilwoman Torres, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, Councilman Flynn. Great. So it's great to have our, you know, that's a big portion of our city leadership that's spending time with us. So thank you very much. Okay, here's our, our agenda. So um, on the left side of this, you'll see we're doing kind of introductions and set the stage for you. Um, and then we'll get into um, different facility types. So we've got two, two kind of facility types we're gonna talk about tonight, neighborhood bikeways and then bike lane type facilities. Um, and then we'll get into the next steps. The reasons we've listed the time there is there's a lot of information and you, you may be interested in one specific corridor and so we just wanna make sure you can use your time efficiently. So if you feel like, hey, I, I'm really interested in Perry Street, um, know that we'll be starting those discussions at 620 and that's a great time for you to really, really dig in and start paying attention. So thank you. And then I'm gonna hand over to uh, Ms. Geneva Hooten to give us kind of the back story about why we're here. Thanks, Chris. So if this is your first time joining the city on one of these projects, we are we often talk about kind of the foundation of where these, these are coming from. So back in 2011, there was a citywide bike plan called Denver Moves Bicycles. It was then updated and then the citywide blueprint, which was the integrated land use and transportation plan came out in 2019. And these all have lines on the map of saying where we want to connect people using bikes. And the funding for many of these projects was approved by Denver voters in 2017 as part of the Elevate Denver bond package. And we have this amazing opportunity to actually build almost 50 miles of high comfort bikeways citywide. And so tonight we're really focusing on seven of those projects that we are bringing through planning and design over the next year with the hope and intention of installing these starting in 2022 and into 2023. Uh, Chris, if you'll go to the next slide, please. And so we have a ton of information to cover tonight. We're really excited to have you all here. So these corridors, we're going to, we're going to do a little deep dive into each of them. And starting at the, the northern end, just south of Sloan's Lake, goes Tennyson, moves over on 7th, and then down on Perry. And then to the east, we also have 6th and 8th Avenue, which is not actually bond funded, but is a paving project that we're going to talk about tonight. And then moving down, we have West Virginia Avenue, South Tejon Street, South La Pan Street, West Tennessee Avenue, we have a really long corridor of South Irving Street, and then West Bates Avenue. And for each of these, we're going to dig into what that means. And the whole point of why we're here tonight is to talk about safety. So for those who aren't aware of this, the city has committed to eliminating all serious injuries and fatalities related to transportation by 2030. We're also committed to building 125 miles of bikeways by 2023. And now that we're into 2021, that number is becoming more and more real for, for all of us. And we're also trying to link people to high comfort bikeways. And the goal of that is to make sure that we can really get people moving in better, in different ways. We know that Denver is a place where a lot of people are moving to 
And the only way that we can really create a, a full sustainable transportation system is to provide people safe options. So on the, the right hand side, you're going to see some some bar charts that that's showing the the number of fatalities that we've had. It doesn't have 2020 data, but you can see that there were 70 people who died in 2019 on Denver streets and that overall people who walk and bike are disproportionately killed. And that is an injustice. It's something that we're trying to work through. And these projects tonight, while we're focused on bikeways, really do have multimodal benefits. So when we're talking about neighborhood bikeways, those are streets, and, and Chris will get into this more, but those are streets that are calm for people. And that means that it's safer for people walking, biking, driving, and really for everyone. And when we're talking about how we get more people to move in different ways, we understand that we can't do that unless we actually build safe and high comfort places. So this, this graph is kind of showing you there are about 75% of, of people in the Denver metro area who say they would ride a bike if there was this network of high comfort bikeways. And there's another 25% who are saying, I'm never gonna be someone who bikes and that's okay. We really wanna focus on that 75%. And even within that, that 59% of people who say, I really want to do this, but I have concerns. Either don't feel safe today, streets are going too fast. Um, I don't feel safe for my kids. So tonight's meeting, we're really focusing on how do we build a network of bikeways to get at that, that audience who says, I would like to do this, but I don't yet feel comfortable to do so. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about high comfort bikeways, for the most part, we're, we are focused on neighborhood bikeways and protected bike lanes. And this, this graphic is showing that there, there are different levels of comfort. And typically when you have a street that has faster moving cars, more cars per day, you need, a, you need that kind of protection. And we'll get into that a little bit. And for neighborhood bikeways, these are streets that have shared, uh, shared condition where people biking and people walking are, are in the street together, but that we have calmed the traffic down We've made it so it really prioritizes people walking and biking. And when, when we need to, we can also divert cars away from those streets. Next slide. So this, this map here is showing the existing bike and trail network in West and Southwest Denver. And what you'll see is that there are some really amazing trails and we do have some existing on-street bike lanes to connect people to those trails. But if you just sort of squint at this map, you can see that there are huge gaps in the network and that if someone lives um, in certain neighborhoods that it may not be an easy or at all intuitive way to get around. So our goal is to start building out a network and that network is what was identified 10 years ago and that we're continuing to work towards implementing. And this proposed network is to connect people, not only to you and to your neighbors and to schools and parks and trails and shopping centers, to rec centers, to libraries. It's to really build out a way for people to get around safely. Um, that doesn't necessarily require a, a car for every trip. Next slide, please. And so tonight we're really focused on the seven uh, West Denver Safer Streets projects. But I also want to call out that West 6th Avenue and West 8th Avenue are 2021 paving projects. We're going to dive deep on those tonight. In addition, West Kentucky Avenue between Sheridan and Vallejo, that will be installed this year as a buffered bike lane. And South Zuni Street is another project as well that is a paving corridor. Just want to talk about those at a really high level. And then here are the, the seven corridors for West Denver Safer Streets and we'll be diving into each of these. And so what I, what I want for everyone to take away is that there's a vision for a network to help people get around. And tonight and these projects are one step to get us a lot closer to what that's going to look like. And we're here at the very beginning of all of this. This is our very first kickoff. So thanks again for joining. We're here in February. We are working on developing draft concepts that we'll be sharing with you as soon as next month and into early April, actually. All of them will be next month at, at the end of March. And then from that, we'll have concept designs with lots of good feedback from the public, ways that we can tweak our designs to match what, what we're hearing. And then we're going to move through 
the engineering phase into final design by the end of the year with the intention of installing starting next year. So with that, I'm actually gonna hand it back to Chris. Super, yeah, thanks Geneva. Um, so what we wanna do just to kind of get the ball rolling, we have a couple of questions that we'd love people to respond to. So Julia, if you could make those um, active to people and you can, um, you can choose your, um, let's see, what am I saying? I'm seeing the results right now, Julia. Oh, maybe I don't see the questions. Is, do you see the questions, Geneva? Yes, great. So, um, yep, so, so just pick your question there and, and pick your answer. We'll just give people a minute or so to sort of um, let us know sort of why you're here and what your connection to the project is. We're really uh, curious so we can help serve you better about what people, um, where people are coming from and, and what they are interested in about us talking about. So that's great. We'll just let this go maybe for not very long, 20, 30 more seconds, and then we can kind of report out a little bit. I'm seeing that about half of the people have um, have picked. So right now, um, I'm I'm watching the results as they come in live, and so let's give you a preview. So um, for question one, what is your connection to this project? Um, I live on or near one of these streets. Two thirds of the people on the call said that that's the case, and and around half of the people said I regularly travel on one of these streets. Those are the, the top two answers there. And then which corridor are you most looking forward to learning about? Um, it's a pretty even split actually. So I think we've gotten a pretty good, um, pretty good response from the community. It looks like South Irving Street is probably, and South Tejon Street are probably the two highest ones. Um, so we will uh, be talking about those in just a minute. So why don't we, um, why don't we end that poll? Looks like most people who have wanted to respond respond and we'll kind of move on with our presentation. So thank you for giving us that information. Great. Okay. So are you seeing my screen again, Geneva? I am. And just in case if the poll is still showing for everyone, you can just X out of it in case it still is, in order to only see the screen. Yep, you should see a... Um, now I see the poll again. Okay, so we'll have Julia kind of close the poll. And then the next screen you should see is a language interpretation reminder again. So let me know when you see that. I'm still seeing the poll, but I'll just X out of it and I'm seeing the screen. Okay. I think we're okay to keep going. Okay. Um, if, um, if someone else uh, is having trouble, um, let me know. So I just wanted to remind everybody, if you, joined, if you joined after our beginning, that we do have Spanish language interpretation available. Gisela is our interpreter. She's over on the Spanish audio channel right now. And the instructions are up here are in English and Spanish um, for choosing your, your, the language you'd like to hear this presentation and so just a reminder to folks that may have joined late great okay so we're actually a little bit um a little bit early here uh, about 10 minutes early and i think have we um maybe what we could do just because I don't want to get into it too soon in case people have uh, gone and gotten a snack or something, <laughs> is maybe we can answer a question or two since we have just a little bit of time. So, um, Steph, do you have uh, some questions for us that sure. make this point in the presentation? Yeah, so one that came up and I know is uh, touched on lightly in the chat, um, but I was wondering, um, the question was, what's the difference between bikeway and bike lane? And we know that this is a common question that we get. So maybe just kind of reiterating the difference between the general term bikeway and bike lane. Sure, yeah, that's and, uh, good. 
I was kind of signed, but hop on in. <laughs> okay. So um, we're going to talk about that in, in more detail, but I will give you kind of a preview. So basically, um, bike lanes, I think we all kind of know what those are. They're stripes on the street that define space for, for bikes to operate in, right? And we have different flavors of those. We have regular bike lanes, buffered bike lanes where there's some space set aside, and then protected bike lanes where there's a, where there's a vertical element uh, between cars and the bikes. Um, so I think we can kind of get our heads around that. The neighborhood bikeways are actually what I'm going to talk about next. And they are uh, safe and calm streets where we don't have striped facilities. So you wouldn't see like a striped bike lane on a neighborhood bikeway, but you would see our traffic calming elements and pedestrian safety elements and sort of volume minimization elements. So we're trying to make the street have slow vehicles and less vehicles and make it feel safe and comfortable for, um, for people that want to ride and walk across and, and, be, and be in that space. So um, maybe I can, I can start going into that stuff. Is there any other one question or should we just kind of jump in? Hey, Chris, this is David. I'll just hop on on top of that too. And I, I tried to answer this in the chat, but in general, sometimes uh, the city will use bikeway as a generic term for all things bikes on a street. But, um, but it's a very good question and we'll try to be really deliberate in our choice of words and help you guys understand the difference between a bike lane, a buffered bike lane, a protected bike lane, and a neighborhood bikeway. And sometimes just for shorthand, we say a bike way as a generic overall encompassing term, but um, we'll try and help walk you guys through this, through this presentation. Sure. Yeah, thanks David for that clarification and additional info. So let's, um, let's kind of get rolling here, Steph. Did you have one more? I was, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, there's some questions about like coordination with local businesses and elementary schools. So it might be helpful before we dive into the specific facility types, just how we've been outreaching to the community so far, especially the specific land use is directly along the corridor. Yeah, sure. So I, I can start that and then uh, Geneva, feel free to jump in. But so we, um, we have been uh, deliberate and trying to be very inclusive about getting the word out about the projects to both um, residences and businesses. We've had a very, um, heavy focus on residences and businesses along the corridors themselves, where we've done um, mailers and postcards, we've done flyering, so in-person flyering to the businesses along the corridors, um, especially the business, uh, the business along corridors that have striped facilities, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, sort of email campaign, we have some yards and street signs, or yard signs out um, that you might have seen in parks and near the schools. Um, we've reached out to schools directly to um, make them aware of the project and to uh, see if they can help us uh, get the word out. Um, Geneva, any other um, things you want to add to that list? I, I think I'll add to say that we're at the very start of this whole project and process. So one of the things that we're planning to do over the next month is to sit down and have some of these key stakeholder meetings with each of the schools, knowing that there are are lots and lots of schools along each of these corridors. We want to understand what those routing patterns look like, where do kids unload, where do the buses unload, and make sure that we're considering all of those things as we're designing. So um, for those, I, I think I saw a few questions saying, what, what does that outreach look like? And, and right now we're just at the first sharing of what we're planning to do, and then we're going to dig into that over the next couple of months. So it's a really good question, and we want to make sure that we're we're really making sure that we're talking, especially to the schools, knowing how much of a safety element there is in getting kids to school safely. Great, thanks Geneva. Yeah, just to reiterate our commitment to community engagement in the word out, being good listeners, um, that's what we're trying to do. Steph? Yeah, I'd say there's one more, uh, or there's many great questions coming in. One that's kind of more generally about our process and how we approach the facility type um, decisions. There's one in here about um, they're wanting to know how we address steep hills, um, especially um, Perry and Tennyson recited, but corridors that have you know grade changes and you know what's our process for deciding how to address those existing features. Yeah, maybe I'll um, maybe I'll let you know, but 
take that one. Sure. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start digging into this. What happens for most of our bikeways is that we are trying to fit the kind of bike facility type. So whether that's a bike lane or a shared use path or a, or, um, a neighborhood bikeway to what that street looks like. So that might be, for instance, when we see higher volumes of cars and speeds on the streets, like South Irving and Perry are really good examples of that. Uh, we just know that we have to choose a facility that's going to provide more protection. Whereas other corridors, let's say Bates, for example, Bates already has pretty low speeds and volumes, at least particularly volumes of cars per day. And so that fits really the context of what a neighborhood bikeway is. And then with hills, and there are so many hills. I, I'm thinking particularly, I think Tennyson came up. Tennyson between about 7th and 10th is pretty hilly. Um, and so we're, we're considering that with the design and thinking about, well, potentially, how do we make sure that people who are going uphill on a bike feel comfortable and don't feel like they have someone at their tail? Um, and just as for a number of the other corridors, the hills are also something that contribute to speeds. It's easy to go down a hill and pick up a lot of speed in a car, and suddenly you're going 10 over the posted speed limit. So all of those things factor into how we can how we decide what kind of facility type is appropriate on any street. Super great, thanks. That was a that was a good chance to answer a few questions from the chat, and we will uh, get to uh, some more of those. Um, kind of, we have a couple more uh, chances planned to answer questions. So please keep keep the uh, discussion going there and we'll uh, do our best to answer as many as we can. So with that, I want to um, start uh, diving in a little deeper to um, the facility types and the different, the different corridors that we've been looking at. Um, so we're going to, I'm gonna talk about um, West Bates, West Tennessee, West Virginia, North Tennyson and West 7th Avenue. So kind of, it's actually quite a, um, the whole breadth of the geography of the, the West Denver Safer Streets project. So the first thing I think we'll kind of reiterate and, and just go through and give a little more detail um, to David's point about what a bikeway is, what a neighborhood bikeway is. So what we've done here is shown some pictures of uh, neighborhood bikeway installations that are in Denver and the kind of the elements that they have. So you can kind of visualize in your head what that might look like. Um, they, they are not um, like striped bike lane kind of streets. So they have the kind of um, elements that you're seeing in these photos. So we're trying to get lower speeds and to, do, to get lower speeds, some of the things we look at are speed humps, traffic circles, extending the curves into the street and median islands. So things that sort of take space from the street and make it feel less comfortable to drive quickly. Um, we want to reduce where there are very busy streets. We want to reduce cut through traffic and keep street, uh, sorry, keep traffic on that street, make it more related to things that are happening on the street, not people driving through the neighborhood to get to somewhere else. So um, diverters and speed humps are, are two, two tools we use for that. We're also, um, the, the neighborhood bikeways have a lot of other benefits um, with safety. And so we're increasing safety at intersections. That's great for pedestrians as well. And then kind of comes back to our discussion earlier about schools and, and how we can help make, make things safer. Um, so we're looking at signal improvements, median islands. These are uh, rapid flashing beacons. So these are those, um, the signs that have the lights underneath that flash when, they, um, when you push the button. Um, and more striped crosswalks. We also want to increase visibility at intersections. So one way we do that is there are, um, at the intersection, you can see what this photo shows is um, some elements that make the road feel a little narrower and that we've removed a couple park, one to two parking spaces um, in advance of the intersection on all corners. And that increases the visibility. Um, that's term, that term we use is daylighting. So it allows cars and pedestrians to see themselves I see each other much better. Um, in general, with neighborhood bikeways, on-street parking is preserved. There are some very minor impacts at uh, key intersections where we want to improve safety. Okay, so that's, a, that's an overview of what a neighborhood bikeway is. I'm happy to come back to that if there are still questions. Um, I wanna talk about the corridors that we have identified as 
um, being um, neighborhood bikeways. That's how we're moving forward with our concept design. So this is West Bates Avenue. That's in the Southwest uh, part of our West Denver Safer Streets area. And um, it's from South Lamar to South Rally. So you kind of see here, um, we go through the neighborhood, head, head east and end up at Rally Street here. And we go by a few schools in this area um, and want to make sure that, you know, we can make this a safe corridor for people to travel for all people. Um, there is a, a little bit of a crash history um, with uh, mostly with vehicles. And this shows kind of the top requests that citizens have have of the city. And in the chat, it'd be great if, um, as far as Bates, like when intersections do we target for improvements? Um, we know that, you know, this, this major intersection here needs to be dealt with, um, but are there other intersections that we're not aware of? So that'd be great to hear in the chat. So these are some of the project benefits. I'll, I'll go through these kind of, um, kind of quickly because we have information to cover, but I can come back. So, you know, we connect a lot of destinations, parks and schools with this corridor. So we see it as a really important neighborhood connection. Um, connects some bikeways. So there's a Raleigh Street bike lane that this connects uh, people to and gives you access to the rest of the network in Denver. We have uh, transit, uh, the Route 51 and 35, and uh, get some, some better safety. So we did see in our data that there's a little bit of, uh, there's a small speeding issue. We want to try to address that and get the speeds down and get improved crossings at Sheridan, which I, I talked about in a little bit before is a pretty important intersection for us to make safe. So this is, um, I, I referenced uh, a little bit the speed. So we did traffic data collection and we've got speeds and volumes that we collected from the neighborhood and on Bates. And, you know, we had speeds between 23 and 31 miles an hour. So 31 is pretty fast for, for that type of street and definitely above our thresholds for what we're looking for for neighborhood bikeway. Uh, the traffic volumes are in the, the low to mid range. So this is in uh, cars per day. So 1,549 vehicles per day on Bates. That was kind of the high spot of the data we collected. And this chart, this will be in all the, the um, quarters you see, but what this chart is, this is a tool we use to identify what type of facilities are appropriate uh, based on the speeds and volumes we see, right? And so you can see in here, so this is the speed and volume charts. Um, so this was the higher speed and higher volume, and this is the lower speed and lower volume I talked about. And what we're trying to do for a neighborhood bikeway is get all this, um, this circle back into this space here. So that's a tool we use to give us a first cut at what kind of facilities we should be looking at. So that's Bates Avenue. Um, the next one is West Tennessee. And so this is kind of in the center, uh, center of our study area. And it's part of a, a kind of a cluster of four facilities that we're looking at. So this is an important east-west facility. Uh, it's also been identified as a neighborhood bikeway. And uh, it, it connects from uh, Houston Lake Park here um, through the neighborhood over to LaPan Street. So you can kind of see here um, the general, uh, the general boundaries and, and where we're looking at going. One of the things in the chat for Tennessee, if you're here for that um, quarter, would be intersections that you think are problematic or areas that we should pay attention to. We'd love to hear about that. Great. Um, sorry, did everybody, I, I hope everybody got a chance to see, let me go back one more. So just to make sure, so you get your bearings. So, you know, Mississippi here, Houston Lake Park, and LaPan. Okay. So, you know, what are the benefits of this project? So we have the, the Houston Lake Park is a pretty big destination that we want to connect the neighborhood to safely. There's also the library, the Athlon Park Library. And we have an, an east-west gap um, right now that we want to fill to give the neighborhood access to the rest of the network, the north-south facilities that we're planning. So this is an important gap connector for us. Um, we want to reduce speeding and we want to connect um, to the, the improvements on Kentucky, Tejon and LaPan that we're also planning. So this is that same, um, same information that we showed for Bates, but for Tennessee. 
And so you can see our vehicle speeds, there's not as much disparity, um, but they're generally higher. So that on average, the speeds are higher on, on Tennessee than were in Bates, but the traffic volumes are on the low end. So this is uh, quite low in terms of vehicles per day. Um, you can see over here on the chart, um, what we need to try to do with Tennessee, what we think we need to do with Tennessee is try to reduce the speeds. So get the speeds over here left on this chart so that we're in this neighborhood bikeway um, area and people can feel comfortable using the street. Okay, um, so that's Tennessee. And next up is West Virginia Avenue. And um, what we've uh, we've shown here, so this is a neighborhood bikeway again. So all the, the corridors I'm gonna talk about are neighborhood bikeways. And this is from Knox to the Platte River Trail. So this is a pretty long corridor um, and it, it connects quite a few schools through the neighborhood. It connects to a lot of north south facilities and it connects over, over to the Platte River Trail and Platte River Drive here. Um, so this, uh, we feel like this is a very important neighborhood connector. It's been identified as a neighborhood bikeway. There is, um, there are some pretty serious crash history that we're looking at and making sure we understand why and what the patterns are. Um, if there are, if people have more information about um, intersections they feel are dangerous um, or that we need to pay attention to, please put that in the chat. We do know that the intersection of Virginia and La Pan um, and, and is a pretty big, um, big spot for us that we're really trying to pay attention to with the railroad tracks go through and um, it gets kind of complicated there. The project benefits. So um, the project benefits for this are we have a lot of schools that we're trying to connect. We want to get across Federal Boulevard a, a lot a lot safer and more comfortably. There is a project that um, CDOT's working on there as well. And so we're coordinating with that project um, to try to make sure that the pedestrian and bike safety is, is improved and meets our needs. There are transit connections um, with the bus routes 30 and 31. One of the key things we want out of this neighborhood bikeway is not only the bikeway connections, but we want to get the, um, the speeds and speeds down. So I'll show you that in a second. Um, and the, uh, we have a lot of bikeways we're trying to connect to, the Platte River Trail, Knox Court, Tejon, and La Pan. Oops. There we go. So this is, um, this is that same data chart we've been showing. So this is what Virginia looks like today. And so the vehicle speeds are on the low end from 22 up to as high as 32. And generally the speeds and volumes um, that you see here are higher on the Eastern part of the corridor than on the Western part of the corridor. So we are kind of looking at it in pieces and the Eastern part kind of near the high school is where the volumes are high and we've seen the highest speeds. And so we're paying particular attention to like speed mitigation, making sure that um, people are going slow, um, trying to get interventions with that. So that's how we'll work forward with our concept design. And you can see in this chart, you know, what we'd like to do in, in, uh, in general is to get this, get those speeds down. That's really a focus for us with Virginia. Okay, and um, the last one I wanna talk about tonight is uh, the north part of sort of a Perry Tennyson connection. So this is in the north part of our study area. Um, you can see Colfax Avenue. This is Sloan's Lake Park at the top. You go across Colfax Avenue and connect down Perry and Perry goes across Sixth Avenue and, and down to near Alameda. So Geneva will talk about that, that piece in a little later, but I wanna talk about this north piece. So um, we had an interesting, um, when we collected data and looked We've um, realigned this one. So originally, we were kind of along Perry Street all the way up, but Perry is very busy, very fast, very narrow. And so we've looked at, at options based on community input um, from a couple of different planning processes. So where we've ended up um, is try, we said, hey, that's a great idea. There was a preference for a bikeway on Tennyson. We took a look. We think it's a great idea too. And I guess we're presenting that to you folks. Um, to see what you think um, at this meeting. But um, right now we're thinking it's uh, Tennyson from 17th down to 7th across Lakewood Gulch on that um, pedestrian bike bridge. 
and then on seventh over to Perry. Right. So this is um, so this is some more information about it. So same kind of thing for for um, Tennyson and 7th, are there intersections or areas you're particularly interested or concerned about? You know, there's a lot of topography here. There's a lot of change in elevation um, with the gulch being, um, being low here and then 10th being high again. And then the, um, the gulch here being very low again as well. So we're kind of paying attention to that. It's quite a bit of, um, of crash history uh, in this corridor. That we're concerned about, we want to make it safer. Some of the project benefits, um, there are a lot of uh, schools and parks in here. So we have the Colfax Elementary on the north end and Sloan's Lake Park. We go across Lakewood Dry Gulch and Martinez Park um, and want to make the, the neighborhood make those connections better. Some key areas in terms of crossings are getting across Colfax Avenue. So that is an important thing to make feel safe. There's a lot of transit service. We have the, the, the W line light rail, a lot of bus routes we want to connect to. And we um, kind of like the other neighborhood bikeways, neighborhood bikeways sort of have a theme in that we really want to get this traffic speeds down. And that has benefits for all users, um, motor vehicle users, pedestrians, bicyclists, everybody. And so that's a big goal. And it does connect a lot of, um, a lot of existing bikeway and proposed bikeways. So this is the, the data chart for Tennyson. And Tennyson, um, the speeds are actually fairly high. Um, we think a lot of that has to do with um, the topography. So the, the hill, the big hill there um, between from 7th North. Um, the volumes are in the uh, very low to sort of medium range. And that's what that means on this chart we've been looking at in terms of where that dot falls. And it's kind of the same story. We want it to move further, further over to the left and get those speeds down for Tennyson. So I, I just um, gave everybody a lot of information about oh, places all over the, in our study area. And I know that it's kind of a lot to take in there. We have recorded this uh, meeting, so it will be available on, um, on the web if you need to go back and kind of take a look and this uh, presentation as well. But I figured um, right now would be a good time, now we've gotten into the quarter a little bit, to take a few questions. And I was going to pitch back to Steph if she is available. So I didn't introduce Steph, but she works with me and she's quite wonderful and she's gonna help us understand what you all want to hear about. Hello everyone. Uh, so we had, we're gonna start off Oh, with a question from the Akmar Park neighborhood. Um, they express excitement about getting bike infrastructure in the neighborhood and wanted to know how the new infrastructure types reduce speeding and make the whole neighborhood safer for everyone. And I'm gonna pitch this to you, Geneva. Yeah, definitely. So the question about like, how does bike infrastructure make it safer for everyone, one way, especially for neighborhood bikeways, is that those are streets that we're, we're really aiming on, on driving speeds down. So in all of those charts where Chris was showing and the, the circle was too far into the speeding, we're, we're aiming on adding things like traffic circles and speed humps and um, <clears throat> corner extensions and lots of things that just make it so that People can't fly down streets, especially if the streets don't have a ton of on-street parking, which usually adds a little bit more friction. So that automatically, whenever we drop speeds, we're also increasing safety. For those who were a little less into the, the weeds on this stuff, speed is the number one factor that predicts a crash to happen and also the impacts the severity of the crash. And anytime that you have a severe crash, someone is more likely to be injured or killed. So speed for us is such a major thing that we use. And for some of the striped bike lanes, like the protected bike lanes that we'll be talking about, like on Tejon and Irving, by narrowing the, currently if there's a, a street and there's a lot of open space on that street, it tends to also increase speeds. So when we add in facilities that are dedicated for people biking, it tends to slow down vehicular speeds 
And we're also focusing on the intersections by adding things like curb extensions, even with protected bike lanes. And so all of those features together drive down speeds and that automatically makes it safer for everyone, including those who are driving and walking. So it really is a multimodal emphasis. Great, thank you, Geneva. Um, so one question we had specifically about Bates, but I think could be applicable to several of our neighborhood bikeways. Will daylighting features be employed at every intersection along Bates? And Geneva, this might be a question for you as well. Yep, good question. And we we're really excited to share concept designs with you next month. So we're not gonna be getting into some of those details tonight. But I can just generally say that one of the one of the ways that we're focusing on driving down speeds for neighborhood bikeways is by having lots of treatments at the intersections. So in some cases that does mean a traffic circle and in other cases that means um, median crossings. So you kind of narrow it down and, and provide a, a place for people to cross the street more um, more easily and also curb extensions. And we are focusing at the intersection as much as we can, knowing that it's, it's one of those factors that helps people cross the street, um, which therefore makes it a better pedestrian environment, and also again focuses on speeds. So for Bates, um, all, of our, all of the neighborhood bikeways that we're designing right at the moment, will, you'll see quite a lot of treatments at the intersection. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then it seems like we have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, there was a question about how bikeways uh, may impact traffic. Uh, so one is um, related to the redevelopment of Loretto Heights. Um, so that's again a, a South Denver question, um, Southwest Denver. Uh, but you know, how are we accounting for bringing in more traffic and residents. Um, and I believe Gabby is on this call and Gabby Serrato would be a good person to talk to the Loretto Heights project. Yes, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So, uh, you know, with any large development that comes into any part of, uh, you know, Denver, um, you know, the developer usually has to conduct some form of mobility study. Um, and that I based out of that mobility study, they have to do certain remediations to accommodate, you know, the new traffic um, that happens here. And then this is particularly related to that, you know, that element of like, um, you know, private development incurring more, uh, more trips in general. Um, Loretto is, it's, you know, it, their goal for Loretto and Councilman Flynn can certainly, you know, has, has advocated, you know, for, for this is to be bicycle and pedestrian friendly. So the campus at Loreto, it is meant to be more walkable, more bikeable. Um, and now for the elements that are for our neighbors to Loreto that are coming into, that want to come in and to take advantage of the, of the new elements that Loreto is going to bring, um, we, have been asked, we have asked the developer to do certain, a lot of elements, traffic homing elements, particularly in Irving. Um, basically, hopefully they will be expanding the Irving bikeway that Geneva right now is designed, you know, the team is designing. Um, all the way down to Lowell to again provide that connection and that stronger connection um, to uh, Bear Valley and to the bikeways on that side. Now, as in related to general growth in Denver, um, all of our projects, you know, you know, we try to you know establish elements right now that will curve that traffic so that that bikeway, that corridor, that that buffered bike lane will remain that that comfortable you know facility. Um, even with more intense uh, land uses that, that may sprung a, a, across. Uh, so from the developer side, we do have that tool of requesting um, more bikeable and more walkable traffic calming elements to make sure that it's easy to reach. And then on the other side, um, just general growth that happens in, in, in the region. Um, we're trying our hardest to basically build the right facility um, as you know, for the future development in the area. Super. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gabby. Um, I think we will um, move into the next next section and then we'll have time for questions again. And um, I do want to say, so I know it um, it can be frustrating that we can't have a really engaged community discussion because of the type of meeting we're having and how many people. 
And so we just ask for your patience. And the next round of meetings, we intend to be much more um, focused on each corridor and there'll be a little smaller group when we feel like we can really do that. And I'll also talk at the end about other ways you can get engaged with us um, besides this meeting uh, to make sure that you're, we hear your input and that we're listening. So thank you for your patience. And I'm going to share my screen again, Geneva. All right. Perfect. Looks good. So we're now going to kind of pivot from discussions about neighborhood bikeways, which again are like the shared streets with lots of traffic calming, and instead pivot to talk about dedicated bikeways. And those that you can see highlighted in purple as protected bike lanes, and then LaPan as a bike lane. And Chris, you can go ahead to the next screen. So Probably you all have seen a bike lane and know that that typically looks like a striped facility where you have a dedicated space for someone biking and then you have a space for, for cars. And then a protected bike lane has a, a, a buffer of space in between with a vertical or a horizontal element. So that the vertical element can be like what you can see here, which are flex posts, or it might look like a curb. It's some way of really providing that more vertical protection between speeding cars and people on bikes, the most vulnerable people on our streets with pedestrians. And with that, we know that there are always going to be opportunities and trade-offs. So I'm actually gonna start with the opportunities and benefits, which is on the, the lower part of the screen. And what, what we're seeing from bike facilities is that not only having the presence of people biking, making it safer for everyone, but it also means that the intersections are safer. There is dedicated space and increased comfort for people biking, which gets back to those ideas of wanting to really change how people are getting around in Denver and wanting to provide safe ways for folks to do that without asking, we're not gonna ask people to bike without providing a high comfort way to do, to do so. And then separating people biking from motor vehicles as much as we can, especially as speeds and volumes increase. And on the flip side of that, it means sometimes that it can be a little bit more costly because of bike signals. Um, it means that at the intersection, you tend to have some different configurations, which do increase safety, but it might be a little different if you are, are using it for the first time or you see it on a new street. Um, and another challenge and trade-off is that very often it means the removal of on-street parking. And that's um, in a perfect, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to have these trade-offs, but really the, the, the grind is that our streets are only so wide and we are not going to be widening them. So we have to figure out a way of moving people in different ways. And so usually that's the removal of on-street parking and providing that dedicated space for people biking. So the first that I'm gonna dig into is North Perry Street. And this is between 7th Avenue and Bayard. And of the corridors that we're talking about today, Perry has an extremely high crash rate. It, uh, for the mile that it is, it's 146 crashes per mile over a five year period. And that crash history that you see there is, is actually for the full corridor. And most of those crashes are on the Perry section. And so the reasons for that are, first of all, we know that it's really steep. There are high speeds. There's the US-6 frontage roads and, and all of that congestion. Um, and those locations of the highest vehicular crashes include 7th Avenue with 12 crashes, a total of 41 vehicular crashes at Perry and 6th, 19 at 5th Avenue and 34 at 10th Avenue. So there's really clearly a safety issue going on here. And so this project is an opportunity for us to address those safety issues and also address some of those 311 requests that we've seen over the years. Now those have probably been, um, been closed out and addressed, but it's really indicative to us of where we're seeing issues. So things like signals, blocked right of way, signage, um, pedestrian challenges, and lighting. So as I'm walking through the rest of this corridor in the chat, um, if you all are familiar with this, if you walk and bike and drive it, let us know those intersections that you find most challenging that we can be targeting for improvements. Um, so please go ahead and, and add that in the chat. And Chris, if you will move on to the next slide for me. 
So one of the great things about this project is that it is a connector and it's connecting Villa Park and Barnum. We know that Sixth Avenue is a huge division between neighborhoods and this is a way that we can really help people get across it better. So not only is it connecting neighborhoods, but it's also connecting people to parks and trails um, and providing some key connections in the bike network. Uh, next slide, please. So the speeds that we see on Perry, the posted speed is at 30 and the, the vehicular speeds span between 23, 23 and 30. Um, and while there isn't technically a speeding problem based on those speeds alone, uh, we do know that the comfort of people biking and speeding and safety all go together. So while it's not perceived or it's not a, a from the data alone, I can't say that there's a, a speeding issue. We know that still people are going pretty quickly and that it's not necessarily comfortable to walk or bike adjacent to that. And the volumes are pretty high. It goes as high as 6,100 cars a day. And we do anticipate for there to be parking impacts on this segment of Perry Street. And we took a, um, an early morning count, which is what we do in residential areas because most people are, are in their homes at 5 a.m. and humans are going out to make these counts and we're not gonna ask, we try not to ask you know, people to go out and do a 2 a.m. count. So anyway, 5 a.m. count and it's on average 17% occupied throughout that section of Perry. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So that was Perry, and we next month are going to be sharing the concept design for that corridor. And next, I want to talk about South Irving. This is a really long corridor. It's a few miles long, and it is truly connecting a number of neighborhoods in Denver. The limits of the project will go from Kentucky all the way down to Amherst. It crosses Sanderson Gold Trail next to Loretto Heights Park. You're pretty close to Garfield Park and Houston Lake Park in the north. And this whole corridor is, um, is intended to be a protected bike lane. And one of the reasons for that is the speeds and volumes, which I'll get to next. And the other is due to the crash picture that we see. So Irving has a slightly, has a lower crash history than Perry does, um, but there have still been over 200 crashes in the last five years six of which included people biking, nine included pedestrians, and two of those crashes were serious. And so when we look at that, that's saying that there really is a safety issue. And so of that, of the intersections that we have seen the crashes happening at, that includes Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Jewel, Evans, and others. So up and down this corridor, what the data is telling us is that we know that people are going really fast. We know that it is, it is not as safe as it could be. And that we also have a number of community concerns related to signals and signage and view, um, viewing planes from traffic, from parking and from some other issues. So just like we asked you on Perry Street in the chat, go ahead and tell us some of those intersections that you find really challenging and that we can address some safety concerns at. And this corridor, similar to others, is connecting a number of schools and parks. So we have Kepner up at the north, going down, and moves to Johnson. We have Gust Elementary down at the very south. I think I've missed some. Um, the Gulch, the trails. And this is the, our opportunity to not only connect people in the neighborhoods, but especially to connect people to the schools and provide an opportunity for kids to bike to school safely. Uh, next slide, please. And as I was mentioning there, the, the current data that we see on Irving shows that there is a, a speeding problem. And one of the reasons I can, I can guess that that is, is because it's a pretty wide street. Um, there's not necessarily a ton of parking on that street and there are hills. And anytime you have a hill, it makes it really easy to go downhill and pick up speed and not even necessarily realize it. So while it's, it's posted at 25 miles per hour, we see prevailing speeds as high as 35, which is far superior and far higher than we hope to have for anyone um, adjacent to a bike. We have volumes that span between about 2,600 and 5,800 cars a day. Um, and that parking, when we took the data, was occupied at 19% on average. So not, not nearly as high as we see in other parts of the city, but certainly some people are parking on street. 
and very similar to Perry, parking impacts are anticipated. And Tejon is a shorter protected bike lane. And this is one that is going to, to really knit together Athmore Park. So at the north, you have West Bar, you have some of those existing bike lanes, you come down, you have Belverde, you have the KIPP uh, campus, and then it's connecting into the future Tennessee neighborhood bikeway and the future Kentucky buffered bike lanes. So this is a, a really key north-south connection. It doesn't have the same crash history as the other corridors that we've talked about, but that's not to say that it's without, without some safety concerns, particularly at um, Tennessee and Tejon and at Alameda in particular. So similar, um, please tell us how those intersections where you would like to see safety improvements. Chris, you can skip the next slide and go two slides for me. Thanks. So for this corridor, similar to Irving, there's definitely a speed picture here, again, because of those hills. Um, speeds are as high as 33 miles per hour. The volumes are, are lower in the northern part of the corridor. It's at, at about 3,900. And in the south, as you get closer to Mississippi and Alameda, sorry, Alameda, it's 6,100. Parking utilization is significantly lower here. On average, it was 10% occupied. And again, because of the limited right of way that we have and how we're trying to change, um, change Denver streets, parking impacts are anticipated for Tejon as well. And last but not least, I want to talk about Lapan. This is a little bit different from the others that we were talking about because this is only intended as a striped bike lane. There is a fairly high crash picture here as well, particularly at Mississippi and Alameda and two pedestrian crashes. And anytime we see a pedestrian or bicycle crash, it, it makes us pay more attention to that because that means that those are crashes with, with vulnerable populations. Um, and the, the prognosis for anyone hit by a car is typically not great. And that's why as part of the Vision Zero efforts, anytime that we have an opportunity to mitigate and prevent a crash um, and prevent those serious injuries, we're going to try for it. So this corridor connects from Ruby Hill Park at the south all the way up. And on one side of the corridor, it's a pretty industrial picture. We have a number of businesses. And on the other, it tends to be um, a little bit of industrial and small businesses and then neighborhood. So a very different feel from what we've seen in some other corridors, particularly our other, say, neighborhood bikeway corridors. Uh, next slide, please. And this is an opportunity for us to knit, uh, knit some neighborhoods together from north to south and also provide some connections to help people access the trail and access some of the future bikeways like the Tennessee neighborhood, neighborhood bikeway and the park. Uh, Chris, if you can go to the next slide, please. And here, while it's posted at 25, there's a little bit of a speeding issue with the prevailing speed at 28 miles per hour. The traffic volumes are very much in the, th the threshold of a stri striped bike lane, like what we're proposing. So volumes are between 2,800 and 3,800. And parking utilization, we took two counts of, one at just a residential count, and not surprisingly, that was significantly lower. It was average of 11% used on the corridor. And then we also took a midday 11 a.m. count because we know that this corridor is used by a number of businesses. And for that, we had a higher percentage on average utilized at 28%. And for this corridor as well, parking impacts are anticipated. And with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to David to talk about 6th and 8th Avenue. Thanks, Viva. <laughs> So what's fun ab about this is that, you know, the, the projects Chris and Geneva have been t walking us through are uh, mostly funded by our bond, but uh, we all, the city also has ways of doing uh, other bikeway projects. And this is when a street is scheduled to be repaved. And so that's, that's what brings us to talk to you guys about 6th and 8th. And uh, what's great about 6th and 8th um, is that they're a great opportunity. We know that a lot, a lot, one of the first questions we get when we're, uh, we come to a street is, well, why this street? And as we, uh, I walk you through this, <clears throat> I think it'll be pretty clear um, the benefits that this 
that these streets will bring to the community and the greater network. Uh, next slide, please. So one, it's a really important connection. You know, as we know, um, our off-street trail systems are really the, the crown jewel of mobility for uh, bicyclists and pedestrians and people wanting to, you know, a safe place to move. And the sixth, eighth alignment helps connect the Weir Gulch Trail, uh, helps uh, connect to the South Platte Trail. And then, you know, with our other proposed bike network that you can see then up to the Lakewood uh, Gage, uh, Gulch Trail. So from a connectivity standpoint, you're really hard pressed to find a better, better alignment. And that's really what we're trying to do in the city is when we're trying to make walking and biking and access to transit a viable alternative, you have to get uh, people to where they want to go safely. And so that's what this uh, alignment seeks to do. And also, uh, you know, emphasizing the city's commitment to Vision Zero, reducing all fatalities and serious injuries uh, by 2030. And so there are a number of uh, crashes on this corridor, as well as those involving our uh, vulnerable users of the roadway. So that's something that we clearly look at when we're wanting to uh, identify a corridor. So right now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, this wouldn't be your first choice to ride to ride on uh, because there is no dedicated space for uh, a bicyclist. Uh, this, the speeds are high and, um, and there's just a lot of room for cars to drive. So that's um, sort of how it, it plays out right now. And that's why we're looking at it so that we can make it reconfigure it and make it work for people biking. Uh, so I mentioned earlier um, in some of the previous slides, it provides great neighborhood connections. Uh, installing on-street facilities have documented impacts at slowing car speeds when we can narrow lanes and provide a separated place for bicyclists and vehicles. We know we can re reduce speeds. When we do reduce speeds, we reduce our instances of crashes and serious injuries. It connects our network. It also connects to the uh, some of the bikeways that um, Geneva is uh, and Chris discussed and helps complete uh, um, an important connection for uh, for West West Denver. We know that um, you know east west connections, especially when we get in proximity to I-25 and the South Platte, it can become difficult. So finding connections that really get us to those lo locations and across them are really important. And then of course we want to uh, a federal is one of our high priority um, high injury network uh, streets. And so um, making sure that that crossing for a bicyclist and pedestrian is safe when we cross federal. So uh, this is uh, where we are with respects to sixth and eighth. And um, what's kind of uh, fun from the uh, from our perspective when we're you know working on a paving project is that you know we're also working with our street maintenance team and they actually uh, they actually repave for anywhere between 400 and 500 miles of roadway every year, which is a lot. And um, of that of that four to 500 miles. Actually, only 10, mi uh, 10 miles or so uh, up to um, can be, uh, or it typically ends up being a bikeway project. So two and a half percent of the, all the projects we do for repaving end up being bike projects. So it's a, a really important opportunity for us and why we're here is to um, help you guys, you know, make the case for why we're looking at sixth and eighth. And then we'll be back um, to report what we've heard and uh, you know, hopefully finish our design by late spring so that uh, some, in summer we are working towards installing this project and working with our streets maintenance team. Great, so, thank you, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Do you have any other uh, points you wanted to chat about or are we good? No, that's great. Yeah, that was, that was great. It's good to get a little background on the paving program and how much work uh, the city does to try to keep the streets um, up to snuff and make improvements as we go. So thanks for that info. Now what we'd like to do um, is go back to our uh, Q&A piece. I know we've had a lot of activity in the chat, so that's great. And I, I really appreciate you all um, taking that opportunity to share your thoughts through the chat and give us a chance to 
do that. So let's, um, so Steph, if you're uh, available, let's grab a couple, a uh, couple more questions. We've got, um, we have quite a few, uh, we could maybe take quite a few, so go ahead. All right, so uh, I think we got a question at the beginning of the meeting that was related more towards um, some bike lane validation process. Um, so the question specifically was, will there be a bike study on Irving to confirm that a bike lane is needed? But I think it would be helpful to explain our process of validating how we decide these facilities um, and how they relate to our high comfort bikeways conversation. So I will punt that maybe to Chris and then Geneva, I imagine you'd have some points you want to add on. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Geneva jump in there too, because it's really a, um, it's really kind of a city process and policy question. But in, I can tell you from, um, from the person that's leading, taking these into uh, concept design and looking at what they're like today. And we've got uh, some pretty well-defined guidelines and engineering standards and um, guidance uh, that lead us to say what type of facility should be on what streets and how those should be designed. And I guess the, the question of how those streets got chosen comes back to a city planning process over the last decade of looking at um, city programs, looking at uh, streets, looking at opportunities involving the public and, and developing those plans. And, and lastly, I, I'm probably stepping on Geneva's toes here, but um, the, you know, the, the Elevate Denver bond was a vote by Denver voters and this was one of, the, one of the things that voters said they really wanted was better connectivity. We want stuff to happen, we want projects. And so um, we've really taken that to heart and we're trying to get things done. And so I think this is the beginning of a, of a community conversation at this phase of the process. So we've kind of done all that sort of network planning and now we're looking at specific corridors, specific benefits and, and challenges and to start that. So Geneva, do you want to add to that? I think one thing I'll add, and I, I saw a few questions and comments that came through saying, for instance, on Irving, why isn't a bike lane enough? Like, why does it have to be protected? And, and to that, I think it, Chris touched on it really well of explaining that we have guidelines to follow it. And, and, and often if the, let's say the speeds or volumes are higher than we want, and it's within the range for a neighborhood bikeway, and we, we do it, some things like we'll divert cars off of the, those streets. But when the volumes are 6,000, we can't divert 6,000 cars off a street, particular, particularly not one that is a collector street. That's really meant to be a street that collects people to get them north and south. So a bike lane alone won't provide that high comfort status that we need to protect people next to cars that are going 35 miles per hour. And it won't the data tells us that those sorts of facilities on a street, say like Irving, um, won't be enough to provide that, that level of comfort that then will allow people to say, yeah, I feel, I feel good about going out on my bike today and taking my kids with me on that experience. So it's, it's getting at the, how do we build a network that will really change, um, change it so that people start to see biking as an option for some of their trips. Steph, I think we can take, we can take some more. Great, thanks. Um, so we've had quite a, a bit of discussion about parking, parking removal, parking impacts, um, and related to um, all the different corridors. Um, so I, I think generally uh, we are taking a context specific approach uh, when we, we think about bike lane parking removal, but um, Geneva, perhaps you'd like to talk about our, our actual process for deciding. Definitely. So when we look at a street and we were saying, and, and these lines on the map came 10 years ago through a citywide process of, of really doing a lot of data analysis to say, what are, where are those streets that we, we know that we can start building connections in between schools and parks and trails? So now that we're moving those forward into design and, and in the future construction, when we're taking those existing conditions numbers and, and getting out there and getting um, speeds and volumes, 
that's also when we're looking and saying, how does that, what, what is that going to impact the street? And where will we be perhaps removing on-street parking? And if the, if the on-street parking is at a certain threshold um, and we're not anywhere close to that threshold on these corridors, on average, if we're close to that threshold, then, then that opens a different conversation to say, maybe it's not possible to do that on the street. Maybe we can find a different parallel route. And for these particular corridors, we're, we're not there. And we're also in many ways constrained by some of the street network that it isn't necessarily gridded in all of the areas, um, that it's maybe not signalized at intersections that we need it to be signalized. So there are a lot of different factors in, in really confirming the network moving it forward and saying, yes, we think that the street makes, makes sense, or maybe maybe it needs a deeper dive and, and some more analysis. Neva, uh, Councilwoman Torres, did, I just want to recognize, she did ask a question about what that threshold is. Yes. And we should probably share that if we... Yes, definitely. The threshold is 65% average utilized. Okay. And, and at that is that then triggers sort of an, a, greater, um, a greater look. That's a good question. Yeah, that's great. And and I, I know, um, so as we dig deeper into these, so basically where this starts is there's a line on a map that says we should look at a facility. We collect data, we confirm if the facility type uh, is chosen as appropriate. And that's when we start uh, looking at concept designs and looking at benefits and impacts. And so we're really at the beginning of that, but we do, we do wanna be transparent that on those striped corridors, there will be curbside and parking impacts. Um, and so we're, we're quantifying those now. We are looking at not just those streets, but the side streets. So the crossing streets adjacent to those, to see what parking and uses are like there too. And um, we'll be discussing that in a lot more detail at our next meeting. Um, but I know that's um, probably top on quite a few people's minds is what does this mean to me um, in, in front of my house? And I don't remember where we're, we're I think Geneva presented that slide where we're trying to balance benefits with, with impacts. And there are a lot of benefits to these two. So um, we don't want to forget the, that the community has been saying for years, like cars go too fast on our streets and there's too many of them. So um, go ahead, Steph, next question. Sorry about that. Um, so we have one here. Um, it says, regarding Tejon, it looks like the improvements will extend north of Alameda. Will this help deter industrial traffic traveling through Columbine homes and along the park? I believe there is signage and there have been some great improvements next to the park, but it sounds like trucks are still turning onto Tejon and into the Valverde, into Valverde from Alameda. Um, so I think both Geneva and Gabby uh, might be uh, good responders to this question. Uh, Gabby? Um, yeah, so basically, so uh, thank you for, for asking that. Um, yeah, Mo, so obviously, you know, we've had the, um, we've had several issues on Tejon, uh, specifically in the Valverde neighborhood, because we have very heavy industrial on that north side, and we do have a, a bike facility over there. Um, it is the shortest path, basically, for vehicles to just continue down Tejon and in order to make that left um, eastbound on Alameda to reach I-25. We establish, we build those intersection medians, um, you know, try to deter and added additional signage um, in, in, in this corridor. Uh, but we truly hope that basically this bike lane um, and hopefully we can maintain the protective element uh, on, this, on this northern section so that that can truly de deter those vehicles, those larger vehicles from using Tejon from Bella to basically Alameda where it's primarily residential. We have West Barbell Wood Park right there. We build it a new sidewalk um, in there. Um, so this, the, that is, I think, the general intent of all of this is to um, deter that heavy vehicle traffic that is definitely not bike pet friendly. And I also think that CDOT's improved project improvement over in the um, Alameda, over the Alameda Bridge, um, over the Platte River, um, and closing off and making it, you know, basically a more straight shot for uh, for vehicle for larger vehicles to use La Pan. Is it La Pan, Geneva? Right? Yes. So sorry. That would also probably, you know, that we also hope that that makes it more convenient, basically, at that point for the for the larger vehicles to make that left turn onto Bayad 
instead of going through the neighborhood. Um, I don't know, Geneva, if you want to add anything else uh, regarding the, the, the design itself. No. Okay. All right, it seems like we might have time for one more. Uh, so this question, I think, is a really great one. Uh, why does the system seem so focused north-south instead of east-west? Um, and I think this could be uh, better understood in the context of some of the projects that are coming online as well, uh, including some of our paving projects. So. Um, I'll pass that over to Geneva and David might have some input to include as well. Definitely. And maybe Chris, can you pull up the map for us that shows? Yeah. So it, yes, you're right. We have been talking a lot about some of those north-south routes like Irving and Tejon and La Pan, um, but also part of the network that's funded is Virginia for several miles and Tennessee. And I, I think I read a comment saying that getting through Athmar Park east to west is a challenge. So we're hoping that the Tennessee connection does help. And then in addition, in terms of other projects that are coming online in the next year, that includes West Kentucky Avenue from Sheridan to Vallejo. And that is going to be a, a full buffered bike lane uh, for the entire, I think it's like three miles, two and a half miles. And um, so that's going to provide at least one other east-west connection. But I think that you're right that there are, there are gaps missing in, in the network, even the future vision of the network. So for those kinds of streets where you say, wow, I really wish that there were something on this or that, um, go ahead and let us know in the chat. We're always looking at like, how do we, how do we build out a network and, and take into account some of those community driven projects that folks want to see. Great. Yeah. And I wanted to apologize for freaking everybody out with the screen there. I was going through slides so quickly. <laughs> So um, yeah, so this is the map. I think um, just to refresh everybody's memory, it's always good to go back to the map and like, okay, so now that we've we've gone through all these corridors, um, sort of step by step at a high level, what do they look like? What's being planned? What's what are those um, challenges and opportunities? Just to go back and see how this system comes together um, with uh, these improvements and and trying to make that. So that's really. At a high level, that's what we're trying to do is create better mobility and connectivity, better safety throughout the whole West Denver um, area. And so that's, that's what we're shooting for. I think we all have the same uh, goal there. And I think we might have um, different uh, lens on, you know, what are the best choices. So we really want to hear that from everybody. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen for one second so I don't um, run you through all the slides. And I'm going to go back to... Um, where we are in the presentation and kind of continue. So just give me one second. That way you won't get um, screen flash. And we just got a great question from John Hanna that relates to our next slides. Uh, so when we have questions between now and the March meeting, who should we direct them to and how? So we'll, John, we will, uh, wrap up with that piece about all the different ways that you can continue to stay engaged, communicate with us. Okay, so you should be seeing uh, design and engagement next steps slide, I hope. Okay. So, um, so what we're trying to, to say here, so we, we're working through our concept design process now. And when we come back to speak with you again in, in about a month, and I'll, I'll show you those, those dates um, so you can put those on your calendar, we intend to post online the concept designs as they are uh, to share with you. We're going to try to get input. So you'll have a much more information. You won't just be trying to guess what this looks like. We'll show you exactly kind of what's in the concept now so we can get specific detailed reaction from the community about things we need to look at and address. And we're also, we have been already going out to some RNOs and community groups, and we'd love to continue doing that. So if your um, RNO, if your neighborhood organization would like us to come and, and talk about something specific, you know, please reach out to bikes at denvergov.org and we will do that. So we are, we really want to um, be accessible to everyone as much as we can in this COVID time, but we're always available um, at that address is a great place. 
one more. Okay, so um, like I said, we are going to be, oops, sorry. Great. So this, we had this one big group because we wanted to share kind of a high level program and process with you, but we understand that we need a lot more detailed discussion with the community and we want to have that with you. And this group just ended up being kind of big, we thought to like make that happen. But um, when we get into uh, the individual quarters and next meetings, we'll have a lot more chance to have that discussion. So what we've set up so far is on March 16th at 5.30, um, we'll have a meeting that focuses on Bates and Irving and our ideas for that, the concept ideas and try to get community reaction and input. Like I said, you'll have access to those designs before the meeting so you can even go out and we'll let everybody know they're available. March 24th, so the following week, um, we will be focusing in on Virginia, Tejon, La Pan, and, and Tennessee, which it's not labeled there, um, but it's but it's this this piece right here that connects Houston Lake Park. So that'll be on March 24th at 5:30, and it'll be a virtual meeting just like this. And then March 25th, the next night, um, we will shift to the northern part of the area and talk about tennis, Tennyson, Seventh, and Perry. And so uh, we saw, I think there was a pretty good split. I think Tejon and Irving had the most interest of people that that showed up and so you know Irving is on the 16th and Tejon is on the 24th um, just kind of keep track of these dates as we really want you to be involved and we'll get the word out again um, for your RNO and everything we'll also have um, online surveys available so you can give us quick input if you you know um, want to do it that way so to John's, um, to John's question, I'm sure many, many people's question on this call, what happens next? How do I stay engaged? So we talked about the public meetings that we'll have again, talked about wanting to come and talk to your small group. Um, and then these are other, other ways you can get information. So we have a project website. It's, um, we have a shortened uh, web address. It's bit.ly, so bit.ly slash West Denver Safer Streets. And so the, the caps matter. So capital W, capital D, capital S, capital S. So West Denver Safer Streets, that'll take you to our project website. Um, we also have a post meeting survey available. And we will send a, an email out um, to folks that, um, to our email list. I hope everybody here was on that. If you aren't, um, please email us and we'll get you added to that list um with a link to that survey but it's surveymonkey.com slash r slash west denver safer streets uh, we we'll have an email list so you can join that by visiting the website uh, taking the survey or you can leave your email in the chat as well so that's a great record for us of folks that were at the meeting and who who wants to be added and we can we can grab your information that way and like i said um you, we are always available um, in a couple ways that are pretty easy. So email is bikes at denvergov.org. Um, we'll grab your, your question or concern. If you include West Denver Safer Streets in the subject line or a specific street that helps us sort of get the right people connected with you, or you can always call our project hotline. That's 720-865-WEST, W-E-S-T. I'm gonna go. That's the last slide in the presentation. I'm gonna leave that up so that if people want to write that information down or, or take a picture with your phone or whatever, um, that's great. So, so that um, with that, that's kind of the, the end of our meeting. I know that there are so many questions. I saw the chat was really active. Um, I did uh, see that there's a, quite a few different opinions. And one thing I wanna make sure is that we're all uh, in this together and we're all trying to do the best thing for ourselves and for our community. And so let's, um, let's try to have civil discourse and it's okay to, to disagree and we really wanna listen and we really want to um, partner with the community and do the best we can for you. So let's, uh, let's move forward together. Feel free to, to reach out to any of those methods and we'll go from there. Does anybody else have anything they want to add, Geneva or David? the end here. Oh, thanks a lot, Chris. Now, we really appreciate everybody's time. I know this is a lot of time to commit. Uh, we look forward to engaging with all of you. Uh, thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you soon.